here in about four or five months, athletes from all over the world will gather in a country to compete for a prize. It's the Olympics that drives these athletes to eventually mark themselves in history as the next great of their event. <clears throat> and what's unfortunate though, is that regardless of whatever event you like to watch, there's only going to be one gold medalist, one gold silver medalist and one bronze. And there's gonna be hundreds that compete to even get here. And so the reality is that they're competing for a chance to submit their name in greatness in history. But as we're gonna see here today, it's not only those who will gather in another country here in a couple months to have a chance to be great in history, but I submit to you that we have our race that God called us to run here on earth. And one of the things I wanna ask you as we get ready to dive into this text is, how do you want to finish? Think beyond just trying to win a gold prize. Imagine you before the Father, face to face. How would you want him to tell you how you finished? Because one day that will happen. And I submit to you that money never entered into your mind. I submit to you that probably if you had more time to reflect, it was, how did you treat people? How did you live? Did I represent him well on earth? And the list goes on and on, but I would encourage you that as we live this Christian race, I think what can help you is how do you want to end? Maybe work backwards. What do I want the Lord to say? Do you want to hear well done? good and faithful servant? Or do you want to hear just welcome? Glad you're here. Your mansion is right over there. I don't know. But I would, I would submit to you that many of us wants to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Paul is ending this chapter 9 with an exhortation to the Corinthians. He's reminding them that they must run with purpose. He's, exhort, he's, he's encouraging them, letting them know that they need to be eager to run. And we're gonna spend the rest of the time really unpacking this one point and one point only. The heavenly race is ran with purpose. The heavenly race is ran with purpose. Now, let me set the context here. What Paul is not talking about, he's not talking about being saved. This is not a matter of one's salvation. As we know, he's talking to a group of believers in Corinth, those who are believers, the church that he planted. But what has happened is the culture has therefore infiltrated their hearts, and now it's affecting what God has planted in Corinth. I like to say this all the time to remind us as we've been in this for several months now, this text is that, listen, God is not afraid to go to hard places. Yeah. Corinth was a place that was Vegas and New York mixed together, put it on steroids times 10. And so the lesson, God is not afraid of that, but what God does is plant us in hard places and there is an expectation for his participants, his kingdom participants to run in a way that is different than the culture around. Again, Paul is not talking about salvation. We know that salvation is not of one's works. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine is clear with that. We are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, so that no one, you or me, cannot boast. Nobody can boast. And so when Paul, I want to set that up front because this is not for you to work your salvation because here's the question. If you had to work and earn your salvation, what would be the end goal then? 
We're serving in a God that has no beginning, no end. So the reality is, when would be enough? We don't have a God that says, keep going, and then I'll tell you when I'm done. So this earthly, while we're here on earth, this heavenly race that you and I ought to run, we run from victory, not, hear me, to victory. You, the end is already determined. You are saved. You will be victorious. Therefore, it ought to propel you to run with purpose because what God has already set out for you and I, what he already accomplished. Eternally, we are positioned uh, in heaven, seated with him. We don't have to run to try to get into heaven. Christ accomplished that for me. Just stay with me. I'm setting it up. We're going to get to the text. All right. But the question is, and that Paul is encouraging them, what race are you in? How are you running? He ends this text or this portion kind of, it, it, it does two things. He's recapping or kind of what, what he talked about in chapter eight and nine. And then it's also kind of propelling to what is coming in chapter 10 when it comes to warning against idols. And so this, these, these, these three, four verses sit here in a way that reminds us that we ought to run and live with purpose. We, you know, we ought to build up other people. We ought to deny ourselves of what is rightfully ours for the betterment of the kingdom and others. But also it warns us for what is to come, as we will see in chapter 8. I mean, chapter 10. But today, Paul is telling us today, reminding us, that there's a heavenly race that we must run with purpose. When you see in verse 24, here's what's very interesting. He says, do you not know that all run in a race? Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run? Here's what they had. There were two things. They had their version of the Olympics, and they also had what was called the Isthmus Games. So again, this Olympics that we know when we celebrate, it has just evolved, but the same concept existed back then. So he uses analogies to drive his point home. He's using metaphors to explain the principle of how we ought to run with purpose. He says, do you not know that in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? His main thrust is right at the end of verse 24. He says, so run to obtain it. That is his main thesis of these last portions of, uh, in this text. Run so that you may obtain it. Here's the question. The question is, are you one in the race? But better yet, another question is, which race are you in? Are you in an earthly race? Or are you in the heavenly race? And no, I'm not talking ethnic, ethnically. We're talking about running, participant, an event. How do you know that if you're in, here it is, you know you're in the earthly race because here's what happens with the earthly race. It's fast pace. It competes for sure with other people. It has no regard for anybody else. It only has regards of self and self-serving. And it will do whatever it needs at the expense of the way it wants to. An earthly race trains according to earthly means not heavenly means. On the flip side, a heavenly race, help me, Holy Spirit, is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It is one that's not competing with others, but in fact, we're competing together. It's, 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 it's the ability to abide in Jesus while saying no to the earth. It's, it's the ability to be dependent upon the spirit as well. And so I ask, how do you know which race you're in? The other question will go is, you know what race you are in? Get this, by the prize that you want. 
What prize do you want? What does your heart long for? When it's you in your car or in the middle of the night, you wake up or you hit your feet or you sit on the edge of your bed in the morning, what do you long for when you're at your office and wondering why you're there? What prize do you want? I will submit to you, you want a prize. You see, he says in the text, he reminds us, he says in 23, every athlete exercises, here it is, self-control, this idea of discipline in all things. And I love this here. And they do it to receive, here it is, a perishable wreath or crown. But we, notice the we language, plural. Matter of fact, let me say this here. Do you know that we don't have a, we don't serve a God that's just a me God? Very seldom, if you go look through the Bible, look at how Jesus talks about his kingdom to people. Yeah. It is corporately. It's not just you by yourself. We are a piece to a whole. Mm -hmm. Very seldom you will see in there the your God in terms of singular. See, we look in the English translation and it says your God, but really it's translated in a plural, your, you alls, your, our God, our savior. But a wreath, imperishable, per, I, I, imperishable. He says, they do it to compete for an imperishable wreath, an imperishable crown. This idea was a wreath was just this beautiful flower that was kind of connected together. They had leaves on it and they would crown the victor at the end of the event. But what we do know of the text is that it is perishable. It will wither because it's made of leaves. It will rust, it will fade, it will lose its value. So it goes back again, what prize do you want? Sure, you want to move up the corporate ladder. Yes, you want to have money. Yes, you want to be light. Yes, you want to do these things for men, but I submit to you that there is a limitation to those things. They will fade. They will never be enough. It will not satisfy the deepest longing that's in you and I's heart. We think that if I can just get said thing, then this will be good. How many of you all have done that before? You said, if I can get this, then everything will be Gucci and it will be good. But then when you get it, you go, okay, how can I get a little bit more of this right here? Right? You keep moving the finish line. And should I say, the enemy keeps moving the finish line so that you can continue to go after the earthly things because your heart is so enamored with what is before you right now and you're tired for what God is calling you to do. And you saying, look, God, I know this race you got me in is for the long haul, but I'm ready to leave. I'm ready to be done. Let me exit stage and get on another event instead of the one you got me in. Because, listen, it was just like Jesus said when the Pharisees, when they would pray for my religious folks up in the room, you say, well, I'm doing this for the kingdom. Are you really doing it for the kingdom or are you doing it for a man? Because as Jesus said that the Pharisees, when they prayed, they did it for the applause of man. And that was their reward once the clap stopped. They do it for a perishable wreath. I'm not knocking what God has given us here. I'm not saying that we should not steward and, and enjoy the things that he has, but that should not be the prize that we want. But the heavenly prize, oh my. This imperishable wreath. It's imperishable. It's incorruptible. It doesn't it's not destroyed. Look, look, look with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Listen to this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. I'll just read it, verse 3. Verse 4 is on the page, but I'll read it in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us, here it is, to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection. You see this? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here it is. My God. Hmm. To an inheritance. 
that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. And hear this, look at the goodness of God, kept for you, not singular you, plural you, all of us, you individually, but you as a collective. Look, it's kept for you, it's kept in heaven for you. My God. Which means, it goes back to what I said, what God has for us, it's already kept, it's reserved for you. Our responsibility here on earth is to run the heavenly race in a way that we can run it with integrity and with faithfulness and with purpose. Therefore, we, he can give us what is rightfully ours. Yeah. It's kept for you. That should be freeing for you in this moment. What have you done the moment he saved you? Get this, that he's keeping this, in, uh, he's keeping this reward for you in heaven. What have you done? Nothing. The moment you got saved, he says, this is for Colton. Right there. This is for Naomi. And not literally, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> That's right. She said, he did. <laughs> He said, I don't know about y'all. She said, I don't know how y'all run it, but I know I'm running. <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> but you know what I submit to you? What is the prize? What's the prize? You know what I submit to you? The prize is the prize is Christ likeness. Yeah. That is the prize. The prize is Christ likeness. When you look at what Paul is trying to do, he is trying to encourage these Corinthians to say, listen, he says, I gave up all of what is rightfully mine. I gave you, I spelled out in chapter nine in 23 verses, how this, what I, I, I deserve, everything I did, but yet I gave it up so that, here it is, so that he could share in the blessing. You remember that at the end of 23? He says, let me read it for you just in case. At the end of 23, he says, I do it all, why? For the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them its blessings. What does it mean, his blessing? This idea to see the transforming work that he has deposited into the people, those who are non-believers, those who are believers, and those who are even weak in the faith. He says, listen, I become all things to all people for the sake of, all for the gospel, to share with their blessed hope. Who is he mimicking? It's Christ. Christ has become all that we need for the sake of all people. Yeah. Willing to meet and reach us every, everywhere we're at. So the prize is Christ's likeness. And it's, to, and, it, and it's to grow spiritually. It's to grow intimately with him. It's to live a sacrificial life. That is the prize. Many of us try to be someone. I want to be like my mama, my daddy, my grandma, my uncle. I want to be like Mike, who name me, whatever you name it, right? But what does it look like to be like Christ? That is the prize. So I go back. What prize? You know, here it is. You know what race you're running by the prize you want. You know what, listen, no, I don't buy that, pastor. I don't know. Oh, you know. Oh, you know. Oh, you know. And I'm not talking about, hear me, I'm not talking about, you know, you got to have your resources, you got to live, you got to eat, you want to pay your bills. I'm not talking about that. But we're talking about at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what kind of prize do you want to be rewarded with? Yeah. Imperishable wreath. I want to name a few things here, though. This is what's very interesting. When the Bible mentions crowns in the Bible. This is really interesting. It mentions crowns that one will get which is very interesting. So don't get me wrong. Christ likeness is the prize, but we serve a God that goes, hey, you've ran well, you've ran with purpose. I also got some things for you. Yeah. One, you see the imperishable crown that's mentioned here. Not all of them explain exactly what that is, neither. But you then it says there's a crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 19, that is the idea of rejoicing here on earth because no matter how bad your circumstance is, because God is your savior, because Jesus is your savior, there is something to rejoice about because even though what you are experiencing is painful, is hurtful, is not good, the reality of it is God is uh, maturing your faith even when you don't want it to be in the moment. So you have something to rejoice over. But even all the more, we're going to have something to rejoice over because why? There won't be any more pain and suffering in heaven. 
We have a crown of righteousness that he gives in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, that mentions this. It's, you, you get the crown of righteousness because it's through Christ, not through you and me. So even though we run faithfully, each person who endures to the end, we will get a crown of righteousness. Get this, not because of your efforts, but because of the righteousness of Christ that is draped all over you. Come on, praise God for that. You talk about getting an A++ on a project I ain't did. You hear me? <laughs> All I had to do was say yes and put my name on the paper. Holla at your boy. Come on. Come on. See, God knew group projects before group projects was a thing. You hear me? <laughs> Listen, come on. Help me, somebody. I wish I knew that. I would be like, look, teacher, see, God's going to give me righteousness <laughs> because I put my... <laughs> Let me stop. Let me stop. Bring it back. Bring it back. <laughs> There's a crown of glory that is talking about in 1 Peter 5, 4. He talks that when he's in, and Peter's talking to the elders. There's a crown of glory that will be given as well. Then there's a crown of life that Revelation chapter 2, 10 talks about. This crown of life is for all believers, but it's specifically, and, and get this, for those who endure and suffer. So we see it, a God sees. See, that's the beautiful thing about God. Mm. He says, I need you to run this heavenly way for purpose. And I know you've been suffering. I know what's been hard. I know you don't spend probably the majority of your life, 70% of your life in suffering, in pain, experience heartache. But listen, I see that and I have a crown of life for you. Yeah. Yes, that's for all believers, but even those who specifically endure. And those just to name a few. We don't have time to go through all those, but I thought that was very interesting that this heavenly race that we run, God still will give a crown to those who run with purpose, yes. with faithfulness. And let me say this here. <laughs> Getting in the race is just not enough. See, we think I give my life to Jesus Christ, therefore I'm good, therefore I ain't got to do that. Listen, I, we can sit here and argue theologically all day. Is there such thing as a carnal Christian? And, you know, if they're not bearing fruit and we can go back and pontificate and hear and all this back and forth and all that jazz. But what happens with some of us is we think that we get saved and I'm just good enough. We think that I come to church, that's good enough. I just show up, and it's really what I'm describing is religiosity, right? I just do the things to look like I'm doing something, but really ain't doing, but, but I really ain't trying to run. Listen, you got to actually get in the race. You can't just be a spectator. When the gun goes off and says go, many of us just wants to sit into the blocks. There was a woman in the Boston Marathon some time back. She ended up winning the Boston Marathon about... A mile, a mile or so, a half, a half of everybody else. And the people were really perplexed. One, this woman has never ran in the Boston Marathon at all. And if you know anything about the Boston Marathon, it's grueling. I mean, it's a very honorable thing to win and to participate, just to even finish. But they start scratching their head. They're like, how did this woman who has never ran this race before win by such a large margin? Something just ain't right. So they started to do an investigation, and they started to do an investigation. What she did was she started the race with everybody else. Bam, took off. But somewhere along the way, she made a little detour, got off, and got on the subway. <laughs> got on the subway, kept going, and once she got on the subway, she got to a certain point, got off, and she just kept on winning that thing. <laughs> and got there and took the crown and all that stuff. Listen, they was like, hold on. Wait a minute. We laugh, but that's how we run in this kingdom race. We start off well, and you're in God, and you're abiding in him, and you're basking in his presence, and you're on fire for God. But then yet suffering and tribulation comes. And then what you want to do, instead of enduring in that, you want to get on the subway of life, go a couple of exits, get off, and then you want, well, here I am, God. Look what I done did. Look at me. And many of us right now, and I say this in love, are on the subway right now. We've gotten off and we're trying to shortcut God's plan. We're trying to go a different route. All because the race that he set out, oh, help me, Holy Spirit. 
the arrogancy of we. The race he already has set out for us, we have the audacity to say, nah, that ain't good enough. Even though he is good. Again, what is your prize that you want? Because if Christ's likeness is your prize, I submit to you, you will stay on the path. You will stay in the race. But you know what some of us don't do it is that we lack the self-control. We don't want to do it. And hear me, you know what also is self, lack of self-control? It's the insisting on your rights is also a lack of self-control. It's the ability to say that I know I could do this, but I insist on my rights. Remember what Paul was trying to get at. Don't, let's not over there. We want to keep it within the context here. Paul in chapter eight was saying, give up your rights for those who are weak because they think that the meat you're eating is offered to idols. You are becoming a stumbling block. And then they go, no, nah, that ain't it. He goes, I'm going to tell you, I'm giving up my rights, even though y'all supposed to put some bread in my pocket, but we ain't doing that. Because I would rather give up my rights for the sake of others, for the sake of the gospel, so that, here it is, I can demonstrate Christ's likeness. Because guess what he's going to say in chapter 10 and chapter 11 later on? He wants, them, he wants the people to imitate him as he imitates Christ. But we, we can't run or, or we want to run this heavenly race because we lack our self-control. We insist on our rights. Again, what race are you in? But I love what Paul says. He gets these elements. He goes on. He says, he then he goes on. But look at this. You want to know. Here it is. There's elements with purpose. The heavenly race is supposed to be ran with purpose. Therefore, you say, what are those elements that consist of this purpose? We see here in the text, Paul says in 26, he goes, I do not run aimlessly. Then he says, I do not box as one beating the air. He uses two and now he goes, one, when I run, I run with a purpose. Not just aimlessly, not just running. No one ever enters into a race and just expects to run aimlessly. Some of us has went to school and we got degrees because the race that we want to become is a, you name it, a doctor, a lawyer, a marketing, accountant, a teacher, a CEO, whatever the case may be. He says, I do not run aimlessly. I have purpose when I run. Yeah. Which means not, not only purpose, he has focus. Yeah. Yeah. What is the element to purposeful running? It's focus. He uses this analogy, I don't box as one beating the air. Because training, boxers do beat the air when they're training. But really when he uses the analogy, he says, no one gets in the boxing ring and starts beating the air. Let me know how that fine goes out for you. So he uses these two analogies to drive home the point that there is focus for him and there should be focus for us in the heavenly race. Hebrews. Chapter, 10, uh, chapter 12, it's on the board, verses 1, listen to this, focus, you're running with focus here, chapter 12, I love this, starting at verse 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, I love this here, you want to run with focus, let's walk through this, lay, let us, here it is, lay off every weight. Some of us got to take off some things right now. What is, God, what is holding you back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's weighing you down? Is it the approval of man? Is it the approval of your spouse? Is it the approval of your boss, of your job, of your mom? Is it because that you're not where your siblings is at, so therefore you envy them? Are you, are you, do you have hate weighing on you? Do you have bitterness weighing on you? Do you, have, um, do you have arrogancy weighing on you? I don't know. But sometimes the Bible just got, you got to ponder. It says that lay off every way. It says let us lay aside a participant of it, right? You see that? Let us lay aside. Every, not some, everything, which means that some things that you think is good for you ain't good for you, yeah. which means you're going to have to sit before the Lord and ask the Father, God, what do I need to let go? And when he tells you to let it go, don't tell him no, but say, okay, I'm going to trust you. I don't like it. I hate it. I want it. I need it. But you said let it go, and I will let it go. Yeah. He goes on. He says, let us lay off everything, every, every weight. I love this. And sin, which entangles 
excuse me, sin which clings so closely. The sin is there. And it's, you know, but let me stop. I got, let me keep going. Sin that is so close. He, then he says what? Look at, look at it again. Let us run. Here it is with endurance. Yes, that's right. The race that is set before you, before us. Looking to what? Focus, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Excuse me, is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You ain't the only one that got to endure some things. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what helps me when I don't want to endure? I go, surely if Christ can suffer on the cross for me, surely I can make it through this. Yeah, yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't have tears and snot in my nose. That don't mean that I don't feel the pain in my body or my soul aches, but what it gives me the strength to endure is to know that what Christ has set out for me, he, therefore, Christ has already set his race out before him, and he went to the cross. Despise the shame for you and I. You ain't the only one got to endure. You ain't the only one that got to experience shame. He took on the shame. Help me, Holy Spirit. Praise God. Listen, which means that some of us, let get this, he took on the shame. You ain't got to take on that shame. Somebody needs to be free of that right now. Amen. Because at the end of the day, listen, we live a life that many of us think that we got tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, mm. It wrecks me when I talk to folks. And they do There is nothing like putting life into perspective when you talk to someone and they just lost somebody thinking that they had a chance for tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. It's nothing like seeing someone die because they bore the shame of their sins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, this isn't enough. And there's some folks that wanna commit suicide. And I'm not, I'm not I'm, listen, many of you probably have thought that. It's better just to leave this earth. But this text reminds us that Jesus endured the cross, despised the shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that shame that you got, you can lay that at the feet of Christ. Yeah. And you ain't got to hold on to that. Oh, my God. Focus. Elements of purpose is focus on him. He says endure. We see the text. You got to endure. The race is set out. It's already before us. The biggest lie that anybody has ever told you when you set Christ that life is going to be a breeze, it ain't. Yeah, yeah. Because suffering and sacrifice is mentioned over three, four hundred times in the Bible, this New Testament alone. And the concept exists in the Old Testament. Yeah, that's good. <sighs> Focus. How do I give my whole heart to the Father? Even when I don't want to. He says... Paul, he says, I don't run aimlessly. I don't box his beating the air. But then he goes on and he says at the end, he goes, but I discipline my body. I, the verse, keep it under control. This idea of, he talks about, now he's playing on the boxing analogy as literally giving his body bruises. He's not saying he's literally beating himself, but what is embedded in this context is there's hardship and suffering which means that he is willing to discipline and endure the race that God has, and he will experience, I believe Paul is saying that there's gonna be hardship and suffering because if you keep reading Paul's life, he got beat literally for the gospel with rods, right? He got thrown into jail. And so this idea of running the race, get this, he does it so that what? He disciplines his body and keeps it under control. There's this idea of mastery that he's saying. So there are some things in life that is going to be hard. There were some things like that will have suffering. Did you know? Did you know that even for them in that context to participate in the Olympic Games or the Isthmus Games, what needed to take place was there was a requirement that they need to train for a minimum at least of 10 months. 
So for anyone, as he says, to even be in the race, as he says, for all the runners in the race, all runners run, but only one gets a prize. Even in that context, if you were going to participate in the Olympic Games of that time or the Isthmus Games, there had to be a minimum, no matter, no matter of fact, uh, training of 10 months. Then you think about even just, it made me think about even just, well, well I was just curious, just, you know, I was like, man, how much does like a, the average like, Olympic person train for that? And I just looked, and it was just not just, not just sprints, from gymnastics to swimming, you name it. And on average, what they typically say is that these people train, get this, for at least 30, some anywhere between 20 to 30 hours a week, here it is, for four years, for a chance to even step on the podium. And it ain't guaranteed. And the reality is that it reminds us that even in this Christian walk, if there are disciplines and trainings that we have to do to be great for perishable prizes here on earth, which means that it requires us to have some training as well, some kingdom training, some godly training in this heavenly race. Titus chapter two, one of my favorite verses reminds me, and I want to remind you all of what it means here to train. Look what it is. Titus chapter two. Hmm. Verse 11, I read 11 through 13. It says, for the grace of God has appeared, namely Jesus Christ, right? To bring salvation for all people. You see that he, he's salvation for all people, but I'm glad it doesn't stop there. It tells us to do what? Training. When you look at the original text, this idea of the grace of God can therefore then be transferred down to that aspect to continue this one thought that Paul, uh, that, that, that Paul is trying to write to Timothy. So the grace of God comes to bring salvation. The grace of God also comes to do what? Training us. You remember what I said earlier in the kingdom race is about us, not always about you? Training us, and I love this, to renounce ungodliness and, and worldly passions. But it's also training us to do what? Live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Then it goes on saying, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This idea of training to renounce ungodliness, worldliness, but also to live, a, live self control upright, godly lives. You know what that requires? It requires for you and I to cooperate with the trainer. We have the best trainer in the world. Some of us are skeptical. We try to lose weight and we want to go get a trainer and you get skeptical because you're like, man, are you just out for my money? Are you, if what you're really trying to do is it going to help me get to where I need to go? I'm trying to get my body right and tight and what are we doing? This ain't helping right now. These are silly things you got me doing. But then when you stay the course and you start to realize, oh, okay. A month later, you look at yourself, you be like, hey now, hi. Right. you be like, dang. Who said them 20s had to stay in the past? <laughs> they do though sometimes. <laughs> Some things you're gonna start, come on, can't wait to the new earth, the heavenly body, let's go. Um, but hear me though, hear me this, listen, listen, listen. And also the training requires in order for this to be done, in order for you to run purpose, not only does it need to be a focus, there needs to be a focus as we see, but there also needs to be discipline. There needs to be training, but the training only works if you cooperate with the trainer. And if you've been living this Christian life any long, you know God is not going to force you to do anything. He, what I'm saying is that there is a free will of the man and woman. And if you want to continue to harden your heart, he will go, okay, we're going to harden your heart. But if you're willing to submit to his training, submit to his leadership, submit to who he is and what he's trying to do in your life, I submit to you by God and his word, you will therefore start to look more like Christ yes. here on earth until Christ comes again. And I love what Romans chapter 13 tells us. I love this language. When you look at the Bible, it always speaks of this active language that we have to do in part. Romans chapter 13, verse 14 says, put on Christ Jesus. Why? Make no provisions for what? The flesh to gratify its desires. You're going to have them, family. 
You're going to have the desires. But the question is, when you suit up for the race, are you putting on the earthly garments or are you putting on righteous garments? You have a choice in God's kingdom to put on himself. But many of us don't want to. Because Paul ends and says this. I do it less when I preach. I disqualify myself. What he's saying is that I don't want to look like a hypocrite of what I'm preaching. I don't want to disqualify myself for the work that I've been doing, depositing these things into them, into the men and women that God has brought me, that brought in my life. He's not talking about forfeiting your, qual- your, your salvation. That's not what he's talking about. I do not believe, based off text, that when a true, hear me, a true conversion takes place, the Holy Spirit seals us. So many of us will get to heaven, but who just wants to just get to heaven? I'm not minimizing it. I'm not. It's going to be great. But if the text is telling us that there can be crowns for us that's reserved for us, why would we not want to obtain it? Some of us got an inheritance that's coming when our parents pass. Some of us got that. Some of us building that for our children so that when they reach of a certain age, they can have something to leave down a legacy. I'm not against it. I think that's great. But I'm trying to let you show the concept still exists even in Christ in kingdom. He says, so I won't disqualify myself. You know how you and I disqualify ourselves? Just don't train with what God's telling you to do. That's it. I'm not trying. It ain't no what you want to disqualify yourself. Just don't do what God tells you to do. Sure, you get to heaven. Sure, you'll you'll be up there with us as well. But as we read earlier, it'll be tested. Your works will be tested. And if it's built with wood, straw, and hay, it'll burn. You'll be saved. You know how you also disqualify yourself? Just don't run the earth, don't run the heavenly race. So not only don't do what God tells you to do, (laughs) because you you want to run his race using your own training but not his disqualify yourself just run the earthly race never submit to him never abide in his presence never just be with him when's the last time you got before the father some of us need training with the father not just with prayer not just with coming to bible study and reading our words although those some things are true we do need to read our words we do need to study the scriptures so that we can be able to run and remind ourselves of what god is doing here on earth but some of us struggle with one of the training of just abiding and being the presence of jesus when's the last time you sat before the father didn't ask anything but just enjoyed who he was Because I submit to you that when you start to just enjoy and be with him, you will start to run differently. You will. Not because he's forcing you, but there's something about the glory of God that when you open scriptures, when you sit before him, whether it's with tears in your eyes or joyness in your heart, it's something that compels you and you say, man, I want to run and serve you well, Lord. I was thinking about this song, I was listening to this song called Every Mountain. And it said, it says, for every mountain you have brought me through. I just wept because I knew there was some mountains that Lord has brought me through. And it just compelled me to go, listen, I know you brought me through this mountain and I was not faithful. I was kicking and screaming. I was trying to get on the subway. Matter of fact, I got on the subway and tried to outcut you. (laughs) But yet his faithfulness came and brought me through. It was 1992. Derek Redman was the favorite to win the 400 meters in the Olympic in Barcelona. He was the favorite to win. The gun, here it is, train, four years, remember to get there. The gun went off, bam, and he has great pace. He's off to a great start. But around the 250 meter mark, for those who don't know track, I'm not trying to insult you until it's just one lap around the track. At the 250 meter mark, he pulled his hamstring. Pulled it. That's one of the most devastating things when you watch sports is you see someone get there and then all of a sudden they have an injury and it's just crushing. The race continues, everyone comes out and the medics come to attend to him. But he gets up off the floor, off the track 
and he's just hobbling his way, hobbling his way to finish. Oh, Jesus, help me. There was a man that all of a sudden came out of the crowd, hopped onto the truck. So he tried to stop them. It was his father that came and put his arm around his wounded son. And he said, Father, I got to finish. He said, well, we going to finish this thing. Yeah. And his father helped him, hobbling it all, finish the race. What a beautiful depiction of the heavenly father. Yes, There's some of us that have started well. We have been running well. And then, bam, life just, just, just derails us. Whether we caused it, because we do, let's just be honest, or if life just happened itself at the hand of other people, and it does something to you, but I submit to you, the Father came down, he sent his son Jesus, came down to the, to the earthly track, and he wrapped his arms around us. That's why Emmanuel, God, is with us. And he will help us finish to the end. But many of us, I, you want to shoo him away because you're hurting and because you're mad and you're frustrated and you're angry and you're like, I done did all this just to experience this. But I submit to you, put the arm down, let him embrace you and let him help you finish. Yeah. And I love that. Listen, and at the end, it wasn't about getting, it wasn't even about getting the prize. That story is cemented in Olympic history. Why? Because Derek Redmond finished the race with the help of his father. And so that's what I submit to us today. What race are you running?